Hey, thanks for watching this video. Today we're going to be doing some evangelism with commentary. Hey ladies, we're giving out these million dollar bills to everybody. Oh, thank you. You already got one? Oh, did you read it? Yeah. What did you think of it? You guys talked to my Thea. Huh? We had a whole conversation about it. Well, we, I'm a different person. I don't know. We didn't. What did you think of it? Or did... Um, I'm not really religious. How old are you? So I'm 21. This was a day where we had a lot of teams out and about sharing the gospel in this park. And so sometimes you can run into people that have already talked to other people on your team. In that kind of situation, I've learned over time to not just miss the opportunity in front of us, but to even compound on what the Lord maybe has already done through somebody else sharing the gospel with them. So even though she says, oh, I got one of these, um, the question that I like to ask people is, well, have you read it? And what did you think about the conversation? Okay. I'm I grew up Catholic. So. Uh, so I'm David. This is my wife, Tessie, and my friend Ivy. Nice to meet you guys. Nice I'm 29. So, you know, I'm younger too, but I don't believe God wants us to be religious. I believe that he wants us to have an encounter with him because religion can be like going to a restaurant mm -hmm. and hearing all about food and having a menu, but never having anyone come and serve you food. With any younger person that explains that they grew up in a religious family, it's important to create the distinction between biblical Christianity and their experience. Because very often, if you just continue to talk about Jesus, it fits into their framework of religion which isn't really where God wants them because they don't have a relationship with God in the present because they never understood the gospel. And that's what religion often does. It has all of the traditions, all of the makings of the Christian faith, but it doesn't have the substance of it. But what Jesus is, is he's actually the one that satisfies this longing that we all have. It's a spiritual longing, but we're separated from God. Have you ever sinned in your life? Have I ever what? Sinned? Yeah. Do you, do you think that uh, God's okay with sin? I that, think you can be saved from it, yes. Well, how, or, how, what is it? Uh, forgiven. How, how would God do that, though? Isn't that interesting that when she's asked, how can God forgive us of our sins, she has no idea. And so that's one of the experiences we have a lot in evangelism. A lot of people that grow up in religious homes, Catholic homes, they hear all about forgiveness, but they have no understanding that it was through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross, taking their sin and the punishment for their sin in order for them to have the opportunity to be forgiven. So I'm going to continue to explain that concept a little more to her. <laughs> Has anybody ever hurt you really bad? Was it hard or easy to just forgive them? I, I mean, there's times where it's hard, but I'm a pretty forgiving person myself, personally. But. Has anybody ever stolen anything from you? <laughs> okay. Well, like if somebody ever did, right? <laughs> and they didn't give it back and they asked for your forgiveness, you'd be like, give me back what you stole. Well, God's given us this life. He's given us life and an opportunity to live, <laughs> but we make choices that are totally the wrong choices. Have you ever told a lie? How many lies do you think you've told? Have you ever stolen anything? No. Even a little small thing? I was when I was younger, like little, yeah. Like from the store, you're yeah. like, oh, I just, <laughs> it's still, still stealing though. Have you ever hated anybody? No. Have you ever used God's name in vain? Yes. Have you ever lusted after anybody or had sex outside of marriage? Okay, because Jesus said, if we even have lustful thoughts, which that's not just healthy attraction, but thoughts that God sees that as adultery. So how much more so would having sex outside of marriage, God say that that's also adultery. So I'm not judging you on my standard, but if God were to judge you on his perfect standard, do you think you'd be innocent or guilty? It's a very important thing for a person to admit their guilt before God. So that's why Ray Comfort's approach from Living Waters Way of the Master is a really excellent way to convey to people their need of a savior and their sinfulness. One of the biggest things that I would encourage anybody that does evangelism to consider is to not just go through that they've sinned, but to ask them how God would see them or judge them based on what they just admitted. Heaven or hell? Hell. I don't know. 
<laughs> do you still you believe when in God? When I was younger, I thought that there was ways around it. So growing up in the Catholic Church, just admitting to going to confession and uh-huh. praying and doing better. But that doesn't that. really do it truthfully. No, yeah, I, because I, it doesn't change. You can you can change some of the. It's kind of like picking bad fruit off of a tree, but if the tree is still bad, yeah. it's going to keep producing bad fruit. Well, do you, this is where Jesus comes in. That literally, God loved you so much that even though you're away from God and doing your own thing, and when we do that, we actually somewhere make ourselves like at war with God. Do you, you've heard of the devil, right? Do you believe that there's a devil or evil in the demonic demons or demonic spirits? So the reason why they fell from God's presence was because they wanted to be like God. They wanted to do their own thing. They said, we don't want to be part of God's plan. We want to do our own thing. And when humanity was tempted, we fell for the same temptation. So in your heart, there actually is part of you like a nature that the Bible says a sinful nature doesn't want God to tell you what to do or not to do. You want to be the one to determine. But the problem is with that, that God has to judge sin. So there's two options. Either God has to judge you, send you to hell for eternity, or he takes the judgment and the penalty himself in the person of Jesus Christ. Not through confession, not through a pope, not through uh, taking uh, something and putting on your mouth like communion. Jesus literally paid the debt that you owe to God for your sin in full so that you could be forgiven. He took the judgment and the anger that God has about sin because God's angry about sin and he took it upon himself. Again, in these situations, it is so important to create clarity and distinction between religion and tradition versus what the Bible commands us to do to be saved. So whenever you're dealing with somebody that grew up hearing different things or believing different things that are not biblical, it's vital to share with them that the gospel commands that we repent and believe because they may be thinking at times as you speak to them um, that they need to start going back to church, that they need to go confess, and you want to convey to them that that is not the answer. The answer is found in surrendering their hearts to Jesus Christ, believing in him by faith, receiving his grace. Bring you a free opportunity to get out of debt and to have a new life. But the Bible says that until a person repents and is willing to surrender, they're never going to experience God's forgiveness. So forgiveness is conditional. Back to the example, if your friend or somebody steals something from you, you're going to say, give back to me. Well, you can't give back to God what you've taken from him. So what God does is out of his infinite love, he pays your debt and says, if you'll let me pay your debt and believe, I'll literally come in and I'll set you free from your shame, your guilt and your sin, and you'll no longer be under my judgment. So that's different than religion. Do you yeah. see how that's different? Yeah, I completely have, I really like the way you worded it. So what are you going to do with it? Because <laughs> it's interesting that you said you brought, you know, straight away from the because you saw the basically Just the, the, the rules and hypocrisy definitely. My family's still very, um, like my dear, the one that a uh, couple of other people have talked to, uh, she's Christian, so that's why. She, and I even told her, I was like, I... Not very many people are patient to sit and like have conversations like this if it's not something. I was like, but it's very interesting. She's like, I think I gave it more of a chance because I am Christian myself and I believe in that and it's nice to hear other people talk about it. Um, but when you have something that you completely didn't go believe in, like Mormons or just a completely different um, thought process on religion there, I guess, it's, it's a little harder to say. But I really enjoyed what you said about that. So yeah. well, I didn't encourage you. Imagine if you had cancer and you didn't know about it. Um, would you want somebody to tell you in advance or would you want to go to the doctor like in a couple of years and have them say, you're about to die in a month. Like we wish we could have seen this sooner. So spirit. Very often people that you talk to don't understand the urgency of having their sins forgiven. And so a great example that I felt like the Lord gave me one day was to bring up the uh, analogy of someone with cancer. If somebody has cancer, they can have it without knowing about it for a very long time. If it's caught sooner than later, the damage can be dealt with um, in a much more simple and easy way. But when it's left a long time undiscovered, that's when it has lethal consequences in most situations. So most people understand that about cancer. But the same thing applies directly to the issue of sin and avoiding God and being in separated relationship with God. 
it has consequences in this life, but ultimately it leads to hell. Um, but it's important to create analogies that help convey the urgency to the people that you're speaking with. Actually, you have a soul and the Bible says that we have like a soul cancer. It's called sin. It's bringing death into your life even today without you knowing it. Uh, and some of the choices that you've made and will make if that cancer isn't removed will literally lead to more and more death and separation from God. So you go to a doctor, they say you have cancer. Are you going to change things? Like would you go to the chemotherapy or the radiation or whatever? If they said guaranteed, you'll be cured. Well, how much more so when God reaches into our life and says, uh, what was your name one more time? Adesella. Oh, I didn't get it. Yeah, Adesella, yeah. I just told you my name. Yeah, I'm David, uh, Tessie, and Ivy. So God comes to you and says, Adesella, you're in sin. You're you're headed towards death. If you were to die today, I, God would say, I have to judge you for your sin. God would have to send you to hell because you rejected him in ways. But he offers you a free gift. He offers you the cure to all of that. And it's his love, not religion. See, religion is all about, again, going and trying to show God that you're worthy. You're not, no one's worthy. I'm not worthy. She's not worthy. She's not worthy. Only one person was worthy and he died so that we could actually enter into him making us worthy, not through our good deeds or our ability to do the right thing. So I would just encourage you, you know, if you did have cancer, you change your life to, to fix it even though you don't see it. When people often have cancer, you know, they go time without ever knowing. They're like, I'm healthy. Don't tell me I have cancer. Everything's fine. I don't need to change my dad. I don't need to. Well, spiritually, there's something that is working in your life to bring death and separation from God. And there's two reasons and kind of, op one thing is you either aren't convinced or somewhere you're convinced and you don't want to have to change things in your life. For the person that is receptive, but still won't um, make a decision to come to Christ, it really comes down to, in most situations, that there's an area of sin that they're attached to. In many situations in our day and age, it has to deal with uh, sexuality. If people are having sex outside of marriage, they know that God isn't okay with that, and they're not willing to lay that down and to come to Jesus Christ if it means turning away from sin. So, do you have a boyfriend? Yes. I would care if I ask a personal question? Do you guys sleep together? Yes. So, because Jesus is God, for us to invite him and have him be God in our life, that means he'll start to make changes. Just like the example with the cancer. You go to a doctor, they say, you got to get this out of your diet. Mm -hmm. Well, somebody's like, I don't want to have to get this out of my diet. It's my favorite food. This food is going to kill you if you keep having it. Well... The person could go and say, ah, that doctor is wrong. I don't have cancer. Well, the sin in our life is like cancer. So when people are, we, everyone in our culture thinks, what's wrong with sleeping with somebody? Most people in evangelism would think, how would I be able to ever ask somebody that personal question? But what I found is that people are very open to talking about things in their life. A lot of times people have isolation, loneliness. And so when you talk with them about even very personal subjects, um, and because the Holy Spirit is present, God gives them the green light to share it. Um, I can think of so many different examples where that has happened. But notice that it is very important to get to the heart of the matter. If the thing that's keeping this person from having a relationship with Jesus Christ is sex outside of marriage, it's important that that be presented and be discussed and talked about. For marriage, well, the point is that God sees marriage and sexuality different than we see it. Yeah. He sees you as valuable. He wants there to be a man in your life that's committed to you till death do you part, not using you for sex. Yeah. And people are very self-deceived. They often, or are you using him for sex? Or are you guys coming together and just saying like, well, because everybody in the world says that we should be having sex, we should do it. But when people enter and engage sexually outside of God, there's always hurt and consequences. When people are open, it's really good to take every opportunity to sow seeds of truth and to also explain to them why something that the Bible says is wrong. Um, whenever I deal with this subject, I like to explain to the people that I'm talking with why God doesn't want us having sex 
before marriage, that it's not just some arbitrary command, but there's real consequences that happen when we violate that command. And God sees from a perspective that we don't see and from a perspective of how it affects the human heart and human emotions. And that can help uh, sow seeds of truth in somebody's mind, even if in that moment they're not ready to repent and to turn away from that sin. Because if this guy isn't the guy that's going to be committed to you for the rest of your life, I guarantee you, you're not going to feel like the time that you spent with him was the right thing. And if, you know, vice versa. So it's hard. It's, it's hard stuff, but it's simple. God says, if you want to really know him and you want your sins forgiven, you have to let him solve things in your life that are bringing death. But you got to trust him. So God will always require you to make a choice. So just think today, God is so much in your life and your family's life. And maybe even your aunt is praying for you because Jesus is calling you. Honestly, he really is. Will you consider the things we talked about? Did I, I give you one of the bills? Yeah, my cousin has it. Will you read it? Yes, I will. Okay. Here, I'll give you one. Thank you. I got extra. <laughs> Thank you, guys. You're welcome. Uh, yeah. You should follow me. You should trade. I don't have my phone on me, but if I give you mine, I can you. Are you at the U of A? No. Something very important to consider is follow-up. So even though this person here is not willing to maybe come to Jesus right on the spot, and feels heavily convicted of her sin, if she's willing to connect more in the future, God can really use that future connection. I've seen it happen many times in ministry, and I'd say one of the unique things about our ministry is that we do try to follow up with as many people as we can. Even people that in the moment of the evangelistic encounter aren't uh, 100% on board. If they're just nice and open to talking more. Uh, we trade contact info with them to see what the Lord wants to do at a future time. Yeah. This could be the day where God gives you the cure. It's all up to you. <laughs> Consider it. Okay, it was good talking to you, Abby. You too.